You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bastu Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Hayes, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Howard Nett. Howard is the executive director of the Business Development Institute International, BD Institute. An industry veteran with 45 years of experience, Howard was one of APMP's 28 founding members, Develop its original strategic plan, is a recipient of the APMP Founders and Vision Awards, and continues as an APMP Fellow. He leads the development of the Capability Maturity Model for Business Development and was the former Senior Vice President of Consulting for Shipley Associates. Welcome, Howard, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thanks. Hearing my bio, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person for this call, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Howard, um, we have some questions for you about your life and career. Let's start with, where were you born? Uh, I'm actually a native of Gary, Indiana, uh, and was born in the same hospital as Michael Jackson, but I didn't get the dancing gene. <laughs> That's great. Um, so where did you go to high school and get your education? Um, well, we moved down from the Gary area to a farming town called Lowell, Indiana. That's where I graduated from high school. From there, my initial ambition had actually been to go into the ministry. And so I went first to Ozark Bible College in Joplin, Missouri, then Great Lakes Christian College in Lansing, Michigan. And after receiving my bachelor's degree, uh, I went on to uh, Fort Hayes State University. At the time that I was in the Great Lakes Christian College, it was not accredited, but they had a reciprocity agreement with Fort Hayes State University. So I was able to get my master's degree there in English and and literature, uh, along with a minor in philosophy. Then... uh, After I taught for a while there, I went on to the University of Michigan to pursue a Doctor of Arts in in English Language and Literature, and uh, ended up not actually finishing the degree because I, when I passed my my qualification exams, uh, I decided to get a job. And next thing I knew, I was in the proposal business And I was working 80, 90 hours a week, and somehow a dissertation never happened. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that'll make that difficult. So you mentioned your first first job was in proposals? Um, Yes. uh, When I went, uh, when I moved to Phoenix, I got a position with uh, what was then Garrett Turbine Engine Company, later became Allied Signal Engine Company, is now Honeywell Engine Company, Mm. right by the airport here in Phoenix. And I worked there for 12 years. Uh, I actually signed on in what was their uh, documentation and data management group because they did not have a proposal function. Uh, But amazingly, it seemed very natural for me to get to do proposals And it wasn't long before they asked me to set up a proposal department. So um, I pioneered the first proposal operations center in what was then Allied Signal Aerospace. And uh, we became the aerospace center of excellence for bid and proposals and helped start several other proposal operations in other divisions Uh, I mean, other units within the aerospace division, um, which really got me into this thing of being concerned about process, being concerned about best practice, trying to figure out how best to represent the company to customers and how best to use resources. And it was pretty amazing because we only had a group of three of us, uh, myself, one proposal manager and one uh, proposal specialist where our proposal specialist was responsible for our uh, resource library and handled most of the smaller proposals. 
And then my proposal manager and I handled the larger proposals. But it, wow. was, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, I look back on those days very fondly, even though I was working ridiculous hours. That's impressive. Probably, <laughs> probably the biggest story, though, that I think attests to what we have accomplished, especially through APMP, Mm. is that when I started, the very first proposals that I did while I was still in the documentation and data management group, they were so poorly run that those of us that were on the proposals, we, we kept sleeping bags in our cubicles. And it was not uncommon for us to work several days straight, just taking sleep breaks and running home to take a shower. Whereas when I left 12 years later, uh, I actually had a new fellow that had moved in and was had done his first proposal. And he was complaining because during the last week of the proposal, he had to work a 12-hour day. So that was a, in my mind, a wonderful juxtaposition <laughs> of what it what the difference is when you focus in on industry best practice, you set up a process and adhere to that process and do the other things that build the capability within your company. Because it isn't just what you do during the proposal, it's what you do between the proposals that builds the competence among your fellow employees who have to contribute to the proposal but are not proposal professionals, mm -hmm. and how you influence the management of the company in terms of how they make decisions, how they allocate resources, and how they support proposal efforts. Such a great point. Okay, so the next one is, tell me three things that not many people know about you. Well, I think I've already mentioned one, and that is that I started out to be a minister. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where I learned the art of rhetoric, which of course is the art of persuasion mm -hmm. and something that underpins every good proposal. Absolutely. So that's something that not a lot of people uh, know about me. Mm -hmm. A second thing is that uh, I still own and drive a 1975 Triumph TR6 that I bought in 1977 in, in Lansing, Michigan. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> uh, so not many people know that, that I'm a classic car buff although I, I don't go crazy about it. I don't spend a lot of money, um, but I love the 1960s and 70s British sports cars. Uh, now, a third thing is a little bit harder to, uh, to come up with. <laughs> uh, I suppose that it might be that my hobby is actually woodworking and furniture making. And so I've made about half of the furniture pieces in our house, including all of our bedroom sets and our coffee tables and entry tables and uh, a lot of the uh, mantles that are on the fireplaces and things like that. So that's been my uh, hobby ever since I uh, started out back in the 1970s. <laughs> wow, man of many talents. <laughs> well, uh, at least a guy who tries a lot of different things, whether I'm talented or not, you'd have to judge for yourself. Wow, Howard, that's amazing. At what point, Howard, in, in the 100 things that you were doing, you decided, okay, there is a need for us to develop the BDCMM. Um, well, that was actually during the time that I was a uh, senior vice president for consulting at Shipley Associates. Okay. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that Shipley was very instrumental in supporting the start of APMP. Mm. And uh, while we were there during the first probably eight to 10 years of the association, it really relied very heavily on Shipley um, to provide program material. Uh, we used the, the Shipley uh, mailing list for marketing. 
Uh, Shipley passed out flyers on APMP uh, in all of its workshops. And uh, we actually sir, had two to three people typically on the board of directors for Shipley Associate, I mean, for the APMP. Um, and so we were very much interested as a company in developing or helping APMP develop the sorts of infrastructure that it needed. Back in those days, we thought that we were doing very, very well to be able to have David Winton on board as a part-time executive director. And he also then worked part-time for Shipley, mostly doing proposal assessments. And so uh, he and I worked very closely together. But two of the things that we felt strongly about uh, in the 2000, 2001 timeframe was that it was time for the profession to, um, to begin building things that were more, more objective and um, fact-based as opposed to simply working with um, things that people said, this seems to work. We wanted to know what really worked. And so in the 2000, 2001 timeframe, Shipley made two proposals to APMP at the annual conference. One actually was to establish a certification program, which at that time was rejected, but uh, within five years came to fruition um, through the UK chapter and the Shipley Limited operation in the UK. And the second one was that we would create something that could be the, if you will, the start of a real body of knowledge by um, following the example of Carnegie Mellon University and the Software Engineering Institute of creating a, a capability maturity model for business development. Um, the person that actually put us onto that path was a gentleman who's retired now by the name of Mike Hum. A lot of your listeners may remember Mike. Um, he retired probably five years ago, uh, but he put us on to the, what was the software development CMM. And we looked at its structure and just to kind of see how it might function, we downloaded it and uh, replaced the word software engineering with proposal management. And then read through what the document looked like. And what it did was show us that we could come up with an objective analysis of what made for um, various levels of capability within proposal development. And APMP signed on to that effort and we put together a steering committee made up of APMP members which I won't uh, try to go in and, and name all of them uh, because I'm sure to miss somebody and I don't want to do that. Uh, but this group of 25 people worked with us for over a period of two years to then create uh, the BDCMM. And initially it was a joint project between Shipley Associates and APMP. And then in 2004, for actually the end of 2004, um, we agreed, that is Shipley and, and uh, APMP, agreed that we would set it up as a separate nonprofit entity, uh, which we did. And it has operated as an independent entity working closely, especially with APMP, um, and still recognizing our roots and, and relationship with Shipley Associates as the years have gone by. Probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> no, but it's amazing reflecting back all these years, you know, how uh, that a lot of effort has been put together over.
when he started Harvard, I mean, like, yes, there was a core concept, understand CMM, Carnage, Milan. At what point did we move to version one? And at what point we decided it needs to be refreshed to version two and the latest version, Harvard? How, what were the trigger points? Well, the big thing is that when we, when we decided to go this way, we went to the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon and asked them for permission to use their CMM label and their terminology capability and maturity model and the various uh, things that, uh, that they were doing. Yep. And, uh, and so we, from the beginning, wanted to maintain a relationship with them. Well, during the same time period that we were developing version one of BDCMM, which is modeled specifically after uh, what were then three CMM models within Carnegie Mellon. One was a software engineering CMM. Another was the systems engineering CMM. And the third was a people CMM. Um, while we were busily creating our CMM, they were busily going on to the next phase of, of their existence, which was to, to integrate their models into what is now recognized as the capability model maturity integration, CMMI. And so when our model came out, we were basically uh, one version behind where they were. So our model did not match up real well with, with CMMI. It was now using a different set of terminologies and so forth. So as soon as we felt that it, that it was feasible for us, uh, we moved on to uh, version two, which was designed to mirror the CMMI version 1.0. Now, most recently, uh, the CMMI Institute, as it's now known, uh, went to version 2.0, which is more of an open architecture model. So we are now, as typical, you know, a couple of years behind them, but pursuing to develop a version 3.0 of BDCMM that will now uh, be compatible and easier to use for anyone that is already using CMMI. And as you know, there's a tremendous number of companies that participate in APMP that are also uh, using CMMI. And those actually ended up being early adopters for BDCMM because they already knew the value of a CMM in their business. Wow, that's so impressive, Howard. So over the years, I know you've probably done a number of appraisal efforts, but do you have a most memorable BDCMM appraisal effort? Um, well, probably the most impressive one that we ever did was very early on. In fact, just as version one was being, uh, being implemented, uh, we did a joint effort with Shipley Associates at a small company based in Carlsbad, California. It was a company that was uh, work, doing most of its work under the small business set aside in uh, US DOD contracts. But it was right at the point where it was getting too big to qualify as a uh, small business. So they basically said, we have to find a way to ramp up our business and grow from $40 million a year revenue to $100 million revenue. And we think we only have about 30 months in which to do that. So we went in and did a BDCMM appraisal, uh, teamed up with, and they uh, used both us and Shipley Associates where we did the, the appraisal and helped them lay out a process improvement plan. And then they drew on Shipley Associates to implement that plan, especially with training um, and consulting. 
And, uh, and they even went so far since they had no BD function within their company at that time to hire or do a one-year contract with Shipley to have someone come in and be their proposal operations manager for them. And what was so impressive about it was that they turned around very, very quickly. And instead of 30 months, it took them only 18 months to, uh, to reach their goal of, of having an annual revenue of $100 million. And they won five free and open competitions against their former uh, teammates um, in a row. Wow. Which was very, very impressive. And I've not seen, uh, you know, many companies recognize that, although we, we had another company in the, um, in the DC area that was an IT support company that did something quite similar, except that they, they did BDCMM on steroids. <laughs> and in one year, they, um, they grew their revenue output or their revenue capture from $400 million a year to just over $1 billion. So they wow. had a 250% increase in revenue capture over a 12 to 18 month period of time. That's amazing. Yeah, so those, those are some of the stories we like to tell. Yeah. The, the, you know, it's more common for companies to have grown slowly to have developed capability. You know, and any, any company that does something really, really fast is vulnerable for, for uh, backsliding, largely because to do something really, really fast, you have to sometimes use draconian internal management techniques. And it is usually driven by a chief executive officer who, when he leaves, uh, things begin to fall apart because it, the progress was really driven more by a personality than by their actually having embedded the capability as the way they did business. Well, BDCMM is definitely an amazing accomplishment, but do you have any other accomplishments that you're proud of? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, from a career perspective, I would say that the thing, the second thing that I'm most proud about was that I was on the original concept development team in the UK for the origination of what has become the APMP certification program. At that time, um, Shipley Limited, uh, some names that you'll know, Tony Birch, Kathy Day, Paul Deaton, mm -hmm. uh, they were working with a company there that wanted to have a certification for their bid and proposal staff. And so they commissioned what was the prototype of what would become the APMP certification program for use inside their company. And I was on the original um, group of people. There were four of us at that time that sat in a room for about a week and hashed out what, what the certification program needed to look like. Then, of course, Shipley Limited went forward and uh, created it. Uh, they worked following this implementation with uh, what was then SEMA Group. Uh, they worked with the UK chapter of APMP to run a prototype version of what is now the APMP program. And uh, that became, uh, you know, very, uh, very helpful. Uh, beyond that, the other thing that I'm probably, and I would say there are three things that I'm most proud of. One is BDCMM. One is being able to help conceptualize what the certification program for APMP was. And then the third was the actual being part of the 
uh, formation of APMP back in the 1989-1990 time period. So there's there those are the top three for me. Wow, those are such high accomplishments, Howard. It's amazing. So this one's an interesting one. So compared to how proposals are done today, what quote old fashioned way of doing proposals is better? Hmm. Um, well, I must admit that I don't do a lot of proposals and I haven't done proposal consulting for quite a few years, probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that one of the things that, uh, was better back in the old days was the idea of proposal team co-location. Uh, technology has made it possible for virtual proposal team management. Um, But that doesn't have, in my estimation, quite the same impact and doesn't create the same team dynamic in uh, most companies. Now, there are a lot of companies, especially in the commercial space, where there is a relatively small number of people across the company that participate in, uh, in proposal work. Mm-hmm. And so they're they're able to develop the um, the camaraderie and the built-in personal trust and relationships that allow them to work virtually about as efficiently as as we as I felt we did in uh, in the old days, if you will. Mm-hmm. But I think that one of the nice accommodations to that is that I'm seeing a lot of companies that co-locate their core team and then uh, bring in the wider network of contributors through a virtual uh, proposal center, if you will. And that seems to be a really good accommodation for the power that you get from the personal relationships that develop with a physically co-located team and the leverage of technology for more efficiently and effectively uh, use resources and personnel. Robert, you touched you touched lightly about the founding members, Howard, the 28 founding members. Yes. All, how did you all come together, Howard? And when, when, where did you all go together? And how did this whole concept started, Howard? Well, that is actually one of my favorite stories to tell. <laughs> uh, you'll recall, Baskar, that I sent you copies of the APMP history. Yes, you did. And in the first part of that history, it starts out with basically Steve Shipley going to uh, the Utah Corporation Commission and uh, creating a corporation that became the APMP nonprofit corporation. Mm. But the story I like to tell is because that doesn't really answer the question, well, where did the whole idea come from? You know? And there's a, I think, wonderful backstory that in my mind um, says more about APM, about Shipley Associates than the way that the APMP history tells it. And that is that um, during the year before that um, incorporation took place, um, Shipley was having a test session for one of their new workshops. At that time, it was called uh, Winning in the Cost Volume. They had just created this and they brought together a bunch of Shipley clients. I was one of, I think, 15 to 20 people that, that they pulled together uh, in the airport hotel outside of La, uh, Los Angeles International Airport, LAX. And they were asking us to comment you know, on, um, 
on this workshop and give them suggestions, et cetera. We gave them a lot of suggestions, uh, many of which they actually incorporated. Uh, but the thing that was really interesting for those of us that attended that session was that we discovered that we were talking about things that were working and that weren't working in our various organizations and how some companies had solved problems that we had but hadn't solved. And over lunch, the conversation turned to, this has really been great. We've been here where many of us are competitors, and yet we've been talking about best practices and how we can learn from each other. What if we were to have an association that was dedicated to proposal management? And, uh, and we, that became a hot topic uh, for the lunch. And so these uh, 15 to 20 people, most of whom then became members of the original 28, uh, came to the conclusion that if there were some way that we could get a, uh, a, an association going that addressed these issues, that it would be a wonderful forum for all of us to learn from each other and to establish uh, principles and best practices that would benefit everyone in the profession. And so the, the Shipley representatives that were there, which was Shannon McBride and George McCulley, they took that message back to Steve Shipley and said, here's an idea that came up and the group has asked us if there's anything that Shipley could do to help us, to help uh, foster the development of such an association. Well, Steve Shipley by prior profession was an attorney. So he knew exactly what you needed to do to set up a corporation and, a, and for that matter, a nonprofit corporation. Uh, that then sparked his finding some seed money in the amount of uh, like $5,000 just to be able to open a, an account and begin doing some building. And uh, they formed a small steering committee um, that unfortunately I wasn't able to participate in, but then that morphed into the first uh, APMP board of directors. And, uh, and during that process, we went from uh, what he had uh, incorporated, which was a national Association of Proposal Management kind of modeled after um, the National Association of Contract Management uh, into what became the continuing name Association of Proposal Management Professionals. Uh, so I got to serve on that first board of directors as the director of strategic planning. And we had uh, I forget how many, I think there were maybe 12 to 15 people on that original board of directors. And, uh, and during the 1990-91 timeframe, uh, I facilitated the development of, uh, of the strategic plan and we laid out most of the infrastructure that is now in place uh, for the APMP, although it took probably uh, 10 years really for it to come to full fruition where the association could stand on its own without sort of leaning on, uh, on Shipley Associates. And since that time, you know what has happened and how the association has grown and how respected it's become within the industry. Hundred percent, Howard. Amazing. I mean, like, if you, if you, do you remember Howard? What was in the first uh, strategic plan? Few points. I'm sorry. Do you remember Howard? What was in the first strategic plan that you put forward way back in the first year of incorporation? Oh yes. Oh yes. In fact, I still have a copy. Oh wow. And <laughs> which, by the way, was back in the days before computers. Uh, for those of you who don't know that there was life before computers. Uh, uh, but what we did was we, we had um, all of these functions 
within uh, within it. There was a membership chair. There was a, a programs chair, um, um, and uh, and we um, we each went through and laid out a five year uh, immediate plan and a twenty year. Uh, where we think the association should be in 20 years. And so we, we plotted out how we thought the organization should grow. We plotted out the initial plan for representation on the board of directors. We um, crafted the, the parameters around which chapters would be um, chartered. Um, we of course laid out the um, the first program and uh, generally had a, a program that included, by the way, a milestone for um, when we would have our first international conference, uh, which now is finally this year. We we said that it should be in, at about year ten. It's taken to year 30 to have the central organization actually sponsor an international organization. The association has primarily relied on chapter conferences. Uh, we also plotted in when we thought the association would be ready to offer certification. Um, we uh, plotted when we were going to begin having a journal at the initial time, we, we initially, we just had a newsletter called the APMP Perspective. And I also have a bunch of hard copies of that, imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but that's, that was kind of the content. It was, it was a real detailed look at the first five years of the association, because that's where we were really wanting to get chapters, the initial chapters established and the initial conferences established uh, and the publications established. Uh, and then we, we took a longer look at what are some of the longer term milestones for how many members we should have, uh, what the trajectory should be in terms of, of where chapters should be around the world. You know, it was logical to think first about the US and then about Europe, but then when did we think that we'd be ready to push for chapters uh, in the Far East, in Africa? Uh, we never did get any chapters started in South America. I'm not quite sure why, but there aren't any there. Uh, but that's what this, uh, the content of the original strategic plan was. It was, a, it was only about uh, 25, 30 pages, but uh, had a lot of content. Wow, Robert, that was. Um, I think looking back now, you know what, whatever you, you uh, whatever you wrote now, it might be it would be great to just see how far the body has moved, what's been done, what's not been done, and <laughs> that some sort of reflection would be amazing. So now we have a very short round, Howard. Um, Ashley will have a go. <laughs> All right, Howard, we have some fun, random, rapid-fire questions for you. Oh dear. So, <laughs> I, I'm not one, sure I'm mentally able to deal with rapid fire. Okay, but I'll try. <laughs> okay. So if you could be a cartoon character for a week, who would you be? Snoopy. <laughs> Love it. Okay. When you're having a bad day, what do you do to make yourself feel better? Go for a walk. Hmm. Sorry, be, nothing very fun there. <laughs> but nice, right? Nature always makes you feel better. Yeah. If you could be anywhere else right now, where would it be? Uh, it would probably be in Boston uh, to see how my granddaughter is doing. Oh, how sweet. If you were arrested with no explanation, what would your friends and family assume you had done? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. Cracked a... a uh, a bad joke, <laughs> really bad joke. I, I'm I'm known for horrible jokes. Oh, really? What is the yes. funniest joke you know by heart? Oh, oh, 
gee, <laughs> you would have to ask that. Uh, some of my favorite jokes are are actually the ones about my name because I've always been teased about being a nut, you know? <laughs> and so my, my favorite jokes that I tell are, uh, and this is a true story, uh, when my mother was pregnant, it was back in the days before you knew the sex of a child before it was born, uh, they were seriously thinking that if I were a girl, they were going to name me after my mother's best friend, whose name happened to be Hazel. And so I would have been Hazel Nut. <laughs> Very fun. All right, last one, Howard. If your five-year-old self suddenly found themselves inhabiting your current body, what would your five-year-old self do first? Get into trouble. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what kind of trouble it would be, but, uh, but it would have to be get into some kind of trouble. Most, mostly, uh, at five years old, I was obsessed with having a dog. Aww. So probably the, the thing that I would do first would be go out and get a dog. <laughs> Love it. Perfect, Howard. Uh, there was one more. Maybe I'll go with it as well. What's your favorite BD metric, Howard? What is my favorite BD metric? Yeah. Uh, actually, it is uh, proposal quality. Right. Um, I, I helped develop a uh, proposal quality checklist. And so I have a very strong sense of what makes a quality proposal. And it's one of the things that I try to share with uh, new proposal professionals in particular uh, to give them a sense for what kind of standard they should be working toward, what their process should produce and what they should be expecting of their teams as a product. Round four, Howard. So what are the best resources, Howard, that have helped you in your life and career? The best resources? Yes, resources or people. Well, uh, I would say that um, the very first was when I was in industry running a proposal operation. And the resource there that made all the difference was the support of the chief executive officer of our company. I think that that is the best enabler for any proposal professional, especially one trying to turn a company around to make to give it a real capability in both business development, capture, and proposals. So for your entire life, Howard, is there any influential people that you would like to mention, life and career as well, looking back? Um, well, from a professional perspective, uh, I think that uh, probably the biggest contributor to my career was Steve Shipley, mm. who... Um, saw the work that I was doing at Allied Signal and invited me to come and set up a process consulting practice uh, within Shipley Associates. Beyond that, there is such a long list of people that have, that have um, enabled me, you know, especially since creating BDCMM, Tony Birch, Kathy Day, Paul Deaton, uh, Rick Harris, um, many of the board members that have worked with, with me, Karen Shaw, Kelly Carlisle, Don Bynan, uh, who most people in APMP don't know, but he was actually the person within uh, Software Engineering Institute that helped us get permission to, uh, to use their intellectual property and to build from it for a, for a BDCMM. And he's continued all of these years to stay with us as, a, as sort of a guide to the spirit of CMM. He continues on our board of directors and uh, 
is always a tremendous help. Wow, Howard, that's a lot of people in your life. Very <laughs> lucky. Indeed. I, I've, and it, it's mostly been, you know, through the APMP Association, um, the kind of people that I've met, been able to work with. And then, of course, they've translated also into industry people that have been uh, very, very uh, instrumental in giving confidence. You know, BDCMM has not had an easy road. It hasn't had any government requiring people to use it. So we've always had to sell it by, uh, by value proposition. And so the, the people that have gotten it and have helped us uh, move into their companies and help them make a difference, those people cannot be undervalued in the greater scheme of things. You know, like right now, uh, the corporation that uh, Karen Shaw works with, which is BAE Systems, both in the US and the UK have pretty much adopted BDCMM as their corporation's standard for business development. Wow. Those sorts of things make you realize that you've done something that is valuable, that has the potential to endure, that if you will, leaves a bit of a legacy that says that the work that you've done, the people that whose help you've accepted and what you've created has not been for nothing, that instead it goes on and will continue to help people. Uh, you know, I, I never want to meet proposal professionals again that admit to having uh, bedrolls in their cubicles at work or that have as a badge of honor, like Eric Gregory did, of having worked 72 hours straight on a proposal. That's, that's not a profession, that's brutality. And what, what we've done over these years and what I'm really proud about having been a part of has been the realization that business development capture and proposals represents not just an art, but a science that can make those in, engaged in those professions better able to do their job and able to have a life outside of their job. And to me, that, that means so much because that's not the way it was in 1981 when mm -hmm. I started as the, uh, well, I guess it was actually in the 82, uh, when I started as the originating uh, proposal operations manager for Allied Signal Engines Company. Yeah, Howard, you have really helped this profession come along and really improved work-life balance for a lot of people. So if someone asked you to be their apprentice and learn all that you know, what, how would you teach them? Um, well, I haven't had much experience with that. I, I do feel like I've had a mentor kind of relationship with a lot of people, um, people that um, I think I helped kind of get started. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly been a matter of pointing them in the direction of, you know, the number of people that I've introduced to APMP, I don't know how many hundreds, maybe thousands of them there have been. Uh, the number of people that I've introduced to other uh, related skill sets that can help them contribute more where they are or grow their career more, uh, like training or, or even certification in competitive intelligence, uh, learning to work in a knowledge management environment instead of just a, uh, a sort of 
propose a library environment, um, trying to show them some of the things that can make their, uh, their roles more effective and efficient. Um, and a lot of the things, a lot of the presentations that I've done at APMP have been directed that way. You know, here are best practices you can use. And so I, I guess that the things I would point them to are critical best practices, critical learning uh, experiences they need to have, and those things that can put added value on them in their professional life. Uh, so I guess those are the sorts of things that I would do. I would. I also really enjoy working with them. Uh, I basically uh, mentored Paul Deaton uh, when he became a BDCMM appraiser, and I've worked with other appraisers as well. Uh, you know, so working together, pointing them at useful things that that they need to have as part of their toolkit. And then supporting them, uh, you know, with basically always being available to uh, to try to help if there's a way I can. That's great. It sounds like you're a great mentor, Howard. Well, uh, I I actually have to admit that some of the people that claim me as a mentor, I never realized I was mentoring. So <laughs> I must, there must be something wrong with me. But, uh, but maybe I'm doing something right, too. Absolutely. Uh, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Um, well, I think that, that the, the biggest thing is learning the balance between process, practice, and people. Um, I, I feel like I've been in a somewhat unique position because through my original ministerial training, my focus was very much on people and wanting to help people. Uh, wanting to contribute to the quality of life of others. And then as I uh, developed into more of a proposal professional and moved on to understand and even lead transformations into focus on better business development and, and capture as unique skill sets, um, I've drawn very much on the people around me you know, for example, um, much of what I've learned about business development came from Karen Shaw and uh, a few others like her that saw proposals in full context. And that's partly where the BD Institute has come from, you know, that we very much care about proposals, but we care about proposals in the context of the bitter, bigger business development and uh, business operations world. So I think that someone wanting to do what I've done needs to develop a real strong sense of people and wanting to help them, has to have a big picture kind of attitude with a willingness to go into detail, but always looking for connectivity with other things. Uh, one of the initiatives that we had that failed, and I'm sorry to say, and I, I guess it's all right to admit failures, right? Absolutely. Uh, about 10 years ago, we tried to set up a consortium of professional societies and professional organizations uh, all of whom were involved as stakeholders in business development. And uh, we didn't get very far with it, but the idea was really great and it, it yielded some nice things for a, for a couple of years. And that was bringing together um, 
what was then called the Society of Competitive Intelligence Professionals, the National Association of Contract Management, the International Association of Contract and Commercial Management, APMP, uh, and, uh, and the BD Institute. And what we were doing was some program sharing where what we agreed we would do would be have uh, select some programs from contract management associations uh, conference to be repeated at APMP because they gave another perspective on proposal development. You know, what, what's involved in on the contract side? We know their stakeholders. And we had uh, some interactions with the International Association of Contract and Commercial Management, which is more uh, European and uh, sort of bridges between US and Europe. And, uh, and we had um, Skip participate, the Society of, Con of Competitive Intelligence Professionals. In fact, we had a little bit of a rejoin of that at the very first capture and business development com conference that APMP held in Washington, DC, where at that conference, uh, we invited the executive director of the uh, Society of Competitive Intelligence Professionals to come and talk about trends in competitive intelligence that proposal capture and business development professionals needed to know. Um, so there's still been that kind of spirit, but the full dream of, of having ongoing collaboration between these stakeholder organizations uh, never really came to full fruition. Oh, that's so interesting, Howard. You've had quite a career. What is next for you? Uh, I guess eventually I have to retire. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be 74 this year. Wow. And I promised my wife that I would retire by 75. So this, uh, this cycle uh, of involvement uh, could be my last. It might not be, but it could be. Um, I'm, and so I'm really excited. I'm going to be speaking at the Capture and Business Development Conference, uh, the APMP conference there in DC at the end of this month. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at the uh, first APMP Bid and Proposal Con in Europe, in Amsterdam, uh, 1st of March. Oh, that's exciting. And then I'll be at the CMMI Capability Counts Conference in April. And of course, the APMP Bid and Proposal Con uh, Conference in Nashville. And I, I might say that my wife wants to go there. So she'll be coming too. <laughs> Excellent. Nashville's a great place. Yes. Or so I've heard. I've not been there. <laughs> well, I was there once for a conference but I stayed at the conference venue, never saw anything else. So that doesn't really count. I think you guys will really love it. I hope so. Well, Howard, that's all we had for you today. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a privilege to have you with us today at Scribble Talk. We wish you all the best health and happiness, and we really hope that you'll continue to inspire bid and proposal industry colleagues, even if you retire. Thank you very much. I, I hope that I can continue to do a little bit of something, and it's been a pleasure to chat with you and Beskar, and uh, to have the kind of friendship that all of this, all my career has allowed me to have. I feel very privileged, and I hope that many of your listeners are able to enjoy the same kind of benefits and encouragement from people who are around them, especially through APMP, that I've had. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Howard. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays, Pasca Syndrome, signing off. <laughs>